We're in the double digits of Human Factors cast, so we're going to switch it up and talk about board games. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Here are your hosts, Nick Rome and Billy Hall. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. My name is Nick Rome, and I couldn't do this here alone. <laughs> so. I'm joined here today by Mr. Billy Hall, my co-host. Hey, everybody. How's it going today? Uh, Billy, how are you, buddy? I'm doing fine. Actually, I am, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. You're, this always, you're always looking forward to every episode. I really like spending time with you. That's not why you're looking forward to this episode. I like attention. That's not why you're looking forward to this episode. I it's, love board games. It's the content. <laughs> <laughs> It's the content. Billy, what are we talking about today? We're talking about board games, especially in the sense of design. Board games. Man, I am bored just thinking about games. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Matt, so so this is this is like a big topic for you, man, because you It's it's not only just a big topic for me, I think it's also important for anybody out there who's looking at getting into game design. Well yeah, and, and any design really. Like there's some important things that you can hammer home from game design like there there's been some tremendous uh sort of steps forward in ux and design just from the gaming field alone like it's it's pretty important yeah it's it's really what it comes down to is, is is board games are a narrative it's a narrative that's really explored it's a it's it's a storytelling thing you know i'm reminiscing right now you were the first person who introduced me to dungeons and dragons oh yeah i remember that man nick are the bard nick are the bard and i remember when just on a whim i was like i seduced the paladin and everyone was like no <laughs> you can't do that and then i rolled a natural 20 and, and then it just... totally happened i think your character sadly ended up tragically trapped in the underdark turned into a statue of stone for I... one of the priestesses of yeah. loth yeah that is so nerdy of a sentence man <laughs> anyway good times but you have a huge history with board games yes, I've, I only, do. I've only played a couple so this is almost going to be like the Billy Hall show. Oh, let's not go too far. I still look, need your scientific expertise. Look, man, I can only bring so much human factors to board games. You're going to have to almost lead the board games part of this. <laughs> uh, and I'll, I'll take us through the science of it. I like that idea. I, I'm excited about this. I think this will be good. All right. So what's up first? Okay, let's define a game from your perspective. All right. So to me... Um, a game is something that you play, mm-hmm. right? At its that's that's what it is to me. You play a game. Mm-hmm. Now, whether that be, you know, physical or or mental or or whatever, a game is something that you play. Mm-hmm. The technical definition here that we have pulled: a form of play or sport, especially a competitive one, mm-hmm. played according to rules and decided by skill, strength, or luck. Mm. Okay. So there's a couple elements here. Yeah, there's a few. Right. So um, you could you could play it, or Mm -hmm. it could be a sport, or -hmm. it could be a mix of both. Right. Um, Now there's there's competition involved here. I think. Yeah. I think that's what sets a game apart. Well, I mean, you're absolutely right. But competition has changed over the years of what the definition of competition is. What do you What do you mean? Well, like, for example, when you played D&D with me, were you necessarily competing with the other people in the party? That's a good point. And technically, were you even really competing with me? I mean, you were the DM. Dungeon Master. Dungeon Master. But the idea of it is, is that if I wanted to, I could just set down a red dragon and kill y'all. I think maybe maybe we were competing against the circumstances under which we were exposed to. But who's the person that you were competing against? I, I don't. It does, the definition doesn't say person. It says Compet- You're right. You're right. But I mean, the idea of it is, is to keep in mind that a game does not have to be competitive against the person. That's true. That's true. That's a good point, right? And then there are these three kind of pillars here: skill, strength, and luck. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And when I think of strength, I think of like physical, f- 
physical sports, football, mm-hmm. baseball, baseball, maybe. Uh, it's, it's skill using... See, I would consider baseball more of a skill using a bat. Yeah. Or skill throwing a ball. It doesn't necessarily have to do with strength, so steroids shouldn't be... <laughs> <laughs> right. Wow. Too politically All charged. the tro- trolls are just typing away at their typing keyboards away. right now. No. But, <laughs> so well, that's what I think of strength. But when I think about board games, right, it, it often requires the skill of the player, right? Knowing these rules. Strategy, intelligence, knowing the rules, creativity. Right. It, it often revolves around the player knowing these rules. Like if you get an experienced chess player and they're mm-hmm. just sitting there and they're, they're always calculating seven moves ahead. Right. And that's because they've played this so much and that skill that they've you know, developed over playing this so long allows them to see those things that a novice player might not. Mm, absolutely. Right? And now this could be for exploitation... Yeah, I mean, or, like, I mean, like, skills go into the idea of poker. Even though poker has a sense of luck when you what cards you deliver, right. the idea of the mental fortitude, reading the other players, not being read yourself, knowing yeah. when to hold them and when to fold them. I yeah, I completely agree. And then you said it right there too. There's this luck based component to it too, right? It's not just skill. No matter how skillful somebody is, they can still roll a natural one <laughs> when the their. Uh, Rolling on their fortitude absolutely. save to... Was it fortitude or willpower? It was not... willpower, but still. Okay. You're absolutely right. There is a sense of luck to it. Because there has to be a sense of danger. Uh, a sense of being able to lose. If you can't lose, what's the point of playing? Right, yeah, exactly. Is it even a game anymore? Because there's no competition. You're just going to win. I think Star Trek said it best. The idea of you can't really fully appreciate victory without the chance of losing. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And I think this next question that we have lined up here, Mm -hmm. I think this one's more of a question for you, so I'm going to switch it up and I'm going to ask you. Oh, okay. Uh, So, obviously we're talking about board games. Mm. And we've already mentioned things like sports, and you mentioned poker. But what kind of, to you, what are the different types of games? And Mm -hmm. what kind of makes board games stand out over all of them? Well, I mean, there's a lot of different types. I mean, board games have... Um, to answer the second question, board games have pieces that people move around the table. Right. Right? And, okay, so is that what sets board games apart from everything else? Not necessarily. Because a board game is a tabletop game, and it does involve those types of things. Predetermined board, including, you know, checkers, chess. But the idea of it is, it's also, uh, a board game can also involve things like uh, concepts, ideas, moving to places, a sense of a map, almost. Okay, so it has like this uh, sort of the spatial awareness yeah. going on. With, okay, and that's something that um, distinguishes it. I think so. I so, think the idea of a board game can distinguish it. But okay. see, it's a difficult question because there's many variants. Like you love the game, and we'll get more into it later, but you love the game X-Wing Miniatures, right? I do, yeah. Is it played on a board? It can be. It can be. But it's considered a board game. Right, but moving on the board in a directional space is more... I mean, like, I've seen people lay out those big galaxy maps that look like a thing and put pieces on it that are asteroids. Right. But that's not... But I you can those. do that... You can do that off the board, too. You can right. do it on this table that we record this podcast on. Yeah, as long as you have a 3x3 three three set. Absolutely. That's, that's the... Same thing with Warhammer. That's not a board game, either. But it does use miniatures. No. Why are those not board games? Are those not board games because they don't physically have a board that you play on? No, because of the idea of... I mean, they fall... A miniatures game is its own... It's become its own specific thing. It started out like a board game. Okay. But a miniatures game is its own specific thing. I, I digress. I'll get to that more later. But, I mean, the next one, of course, and what most of our fans would probably be interested in is video games. Right. And we all know what a video game is. Mm-hmm. It's It's something... It's... Basically, a game, right, that's electronic that you play on a TV or, you know, it involves some sort of interaction with a with an input device, right? Like a controller Absolutely. or a keyboard and mouse um, or something like that. And then, of course, there are card games. In any game, using playing cards as a primary device, which game is played, be they traditional or game specific, like, for example, poker. Poker uses traditional cards. Right, right. Or Magic the Gathering or uses, Yu-Gi-Oh! if you're a fan. Yeah, it uses game-specific cards. Right, right. And they have usually their own art and style and ideas. And then, of course, there is the sports games. Sports games. Yeah. yeah. Those 
Well, yeah, I, I think they're most commonly referred to as just sports. But what do I know? I don't follow sports. The but sports. <laughs> the sports games. Um, no, and these are just these are physical activity, right? Right. That's that's what we kind of uh, set aside for those. Now, yeah. this, this next one. <laughs> this next one, I have fond memories of uh, finding you in the middle of a night <laughs> pretending to be a vampire. <laughs> We're going to go that deep, huh? Okay, yeah. Hey, I, yeah, no, 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 that's fine, that's so, fine. So you're a role player, though. You, you role I, play. I do a lot of variations of role play. I mean, Dean, that's the other thing I want to get on with the idea of miniatures, because a board game is a board game, and a role-playing game is a role-playing game, but miniatures game uses both. You are commanding an X-Wing army. Right, you could, these, these are what we'd call hybrids, right? Like, exactly. They kind of, they kind of uh, incorporate elements of each one. Yeah. Right, and, and you could even go as far as to say that the you can you can play a sport inside role playing right absolutely like, like you guys, blood bowl is a sport game that's played on a board right you guys could like joust yes right yes, and that's yes. physical yeah and there's many variants like I used to do role playing games you're absolutely right I used to I used to LARP all the time what is LARPing for now those LARP who is live action role playing games most famously known from that silly YouTube video where the guy is th- saying lightning bolt lightning bolt lightning bolt or the movie Role Models, which oh, I get all the time. But there's that very the many. That was the best movie. But those are uh, that is a specific genre of a specific type of role playing game. Right. Mostly, it's any game where you envelop a character, right? But roles to, of a character. Today, though, we're talking about board, board games, games, right? Yes, we're talking about games that you play on a board mm-hmm. that are not anything else that we've kind of covered, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, that's the main idea here. I mean, there are many different hybrids, like you said. There's many different variants and genres to different types of games. I mean, heck, I don't know if Quidditch, the the professional Quidditch League of college is necessarily a sports game or a role-playing game or both. I don't know which one that really is. Like we say, it It depends. depends. So, look, here's the thing. I... I'm going to kind of approach this from, like, the broad stroke of game, game design... But I need you to reel me in and say, like, okay, but how board games? Like, what? What's? How does this apply to board games? And it's really tough. Like you always, like we can always say it depends, but it is a tough thing to peg down. How do you right. peg down a video game? Right. You know, like you've been recently playing Journey. Oh yeah, Journey. But great. some people would say Call of Duty is a is a video game. That's just a walking simulator they like to use. Yeah, that term walking simulator. I, um... See, that's the problem. It's hard. What is a game? And let's, is all games art? But let's let's save video games for an entire episode. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, we'll probably do several video game episodes over the course of. But yeah, well, let's focus on the idea of okay. designing a board game. Okay. So, to me, mm-hmm. uh, board games are kind of like uh, when art and, and math have a baby. Yes, yes. Right? It's like you, you design this kind of concept or theme, and then you mix it with mathematics and, and uh, complex algorithms to um, you know, make these mechanics by which the players utilize for playing... And that makes a board game. You're absolutely right. I could go on for all the time about the different algorithms and math that goes in to designing a game. Basically, you have to take in things like spatial awareness, the age level of your players, and everything like that. You need to right. decide on a theme. You need to decide on mechanics, cards, dice, game pieces. That kind of thing. Yeah. That kind of thing. I mean, for me, like when I, when I think about this, I would go to... Um, like, I'm a spreadsheet guy, mm-hmm. right? And so I, I like making really big spreadsheets with all these complex calculations. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's that's what I kind of find exciting about this, right? Yes. If I were to make a board game, I'd be like, oh, so this player gets this equation and this player gets this equation. And does it, does it equal out? And we'll talk about balance later. But, you <laughs> but know. you're absolutely right in that standpoint. I mean, the idea of it is, is that... Board game, you, it is math. And the great thing about this math is you're trying to get complex concepts of, like, fear, action, adventure across when you're doing it. You're talking about themes, yeah. Themes. Yeah, but you're trying to do it with math. Right. And that's, that's exciting. That is exciting. And and really unique. It's, it's mm-hmm. cool. I mean, yeah, and 
you need to ex- uh, talk about the understanding of relationships you want the players to have with other players, like we said in the game. Example, right. like D and D, the players are working together, or in X Wing, players are fighting each other. Right. Or 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 in D and D, they're fighting against the DM. Oh, they're they, fighting against. They the petrified DM. their bard. <laughs> <laughs> but that usually involves fist fights. No. Or like new games, like Pandemic or Zombicide, where a player is fighting the actual game itself. Yeah, that's cool to me. Yeah, because that it's like. You've, you've almost developed this artificial intelligence within a board game, and it reacts based on how the user is able to sort of make their moves. Mm-hmm. So I know you have actually been... You've actually developed your own couple board games, right? And yeah. I just kind of want to like probe you for your experience on working with those. Like, what is that like? Because this is well, something that I... I don't know. I, like, this is unfamiliar territory to me. Well, the thing about it is, is like I said, I love the idea of algorithms and math trying to tell a narrative. I like the idea of telling a story. You spend ten minutes with me, I'll tell a bunch of stories. And I've been planning and designing a lot of games, most of which probably have never seen the light of day. I would like to play these games someday, <laughs> just FYI. I've also I've also helped in the designing of games by playtesting, coming in, talking to people on the things like that, or taking an existing game and changing it up so that it has a different feel to it. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, but that's a lot of things that I do. I, I, I've made a role playing game and a couple other things and I know it's very, it's in the in the in the gaming world it's very hipster to be like, I design my own game. That's so Ooh. hipster. Billy, Billy yeah. Hall, hipster, everyone. Right? I, I, my beret is coming in the... My beanie is coming in the mail. Fedora. Fedora, yes. Fedora is coming in the mail. Fedora, and like fake glasses that make you look <laughs> hip. <laughs> Big, huge mustache all waxed up. But yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> I, 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 I like to immerse myself in the form of design like this. And I feel that it has a lot of, um, a lot of applications, like communication communicating things, uh, writing skills, things like that, which I lack, but I work on through these things, and also the ability of telling a narrative that can be told without you present. That's, you know? that's, that's a really good point, too, is that you know, you're relying on the players to kind of tell this story, even though you, the creator, is not there. Absolutely. That's the idea. You know? and, and three of the things I can really tell people is... is one, if you want to get into designing a board game, or as just a hobby like I do, or you want to look at it as a profession, or if you even later on down the road you want to get into video game design, because it's true, all the great video game designers will tell you we started out with the board games. Yes, and and I have a really interesting story about that. Go ahead. Um, Knights of the Old Republic, which is widely regarded, Star Wars fan or not, as one of the greater games of the original Xbox generation. Yes. Uh, they actually took their uh, combat system, I believe, from a modified D&D 1. Yes, it did, 1. Come, it did come from a modified Dungeons & Dragons Eye of the Beholder game. Okay, yeah. But and, it wasn't actually ever... It never actually saw the light of day. It was just a engine that was built for that concept and that idea and they took it and yeah, made it their own. Yeah, so I mean, you know, even some of the greatest games are based, their mechanics are based off of board game mechanics. And that's cool. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, the thing about it is, is a board game, you make all the rules, you read all the rules, and they have to be clear to the player, whoever reads it, right? When you're playing a video game, there's a bunch of little algorithms and rules going on in the game that you never see. You know? Right, yeah, no, it's kind of like the behind the scenes... Uh, Excel equations. Exactly. I, it's I, it's <laughs> the it's it's a more basic version. Like one of the, uh, a game designer once told me, the best way to get into video game design is make simple board games and write out a rule book, and yeah. then hand it to a person to play, and not say a single thing. Which brings me to my points. Right. So you said play a lot of games. What play else? a lot of games, all types. Even if you don't think they're good, even if you don't like them, that's. That's not an answer you can necessarily have. Just get exposure to it. Exactly. See what's out there. Because if you tell me, if you come up to me and tell me that Candyland or Pop-O-Matic Trouble can't teach you something about games, games that have been around since the 40s and the 50s. Dude, I learned about life from guess which game. <laughs> which game? Life? No, Candyland. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See, that was, that was your first point. You said you had three points. What was the other one? Okay, the other one is lore comes last. 
everybody always has this grandiose idea of what their game is about with this lore and this very deep storytelling and that's great for telling and that's great for writing down and telling a narrative but your lore change if your lore doesn't you always end up having things that are stronger or weaker or your game mechanics don't reflect it and it's maddening okay so get the game mechanics down first hold up i'm gonna humbly disagree with you okay only because if you if you're developing this concept right Uh uh-huh like i feel like you should be able to sort of like we said, it's it's the mix of art and mathematics. And so if you have to find a way to make mathematics work with your lore, then that's a challenge of game design. I wouldn't say that it comes last. I think that, you know, if you incorporate it along the way and maybe, you know, use the mechanics to maybe generate some more ideas, that would be... Oh, I mean, like, I agree. Like, right now, I've been working on a... 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 a, um, a, a battle suit, a battle mech to use general terms, type of game. You know I'm working on those. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you and your pagan rituals. Yeah, all right. Um, no, I, 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 um, I'm working on a battle mech game. Right, right. And, and so you've, you've developed this concept of a mech. That's, that's what you want. You want mechs. Right, I want mechs, and but, that's my general concept. I haven't come up with things like factions or okay. abilities all right. or... Or what's big and what's not, how teams interact with you. I haven't come up with that idea because I, even though I have the idea of lore, like, you know, there are mechs and people fight in them. Right. But that is more like a pitch than a lore. Does that make sense? Okay, so what I'm hearing is, like, polish comes last. Like, polish on the lore. Polish on the lore okay. side. Okay. I mean, you, want your, you want your mechanics to be able to translate almost anything. That's why games like Magic the Gathering have been around for as long as they have. Okay, because when I saw this point initially, I was like, oh, I disagree so much with that. But okay, I'm glad we came to agree an agreement yeah, with that. Yeah, I mean, right. like, they came up with the mechanics for Magic the Gathering first. Lore came so much later. All right. Okay, uh, so... And so then you, the that... third one, and the third one is, don't be present when other play, other people play test your game. Instead, hand the rules to someone else and have others play the game. I mean, if you have to be in the room, be in the room. If you want to watch, be a watch. But try to make sure that your rules can be handed to anybody and played. Don't don't ask them. If they ask you questions, unless it stops the game completely, like they can't play any longer, don't answer them. See, I'm going to humbly disagree with you. Okay. <laughs> I am going to disagree with you on on one aspect of this. Don't be present. That's true. Don't be in the room, but don't leave them alone no. either. Leave a video camera in there to watch them. Like, you want to know exactly how they're playing it, how they're using it, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because that's the valuable feedback, and that's... That... Dude, I mean, like, you... feedback is an important aspect, obviously, but my main idea of it is, is, like, a lot of people want to they, they... play in their board game. We make the no. games yeah. we want to play in. Right. Don't do that. Because you understand the rules clearly. And if I sat down here and pulled out a board game and played it with you, and you didn't have time to read the 30-page rule book, what are you going to do the whole time? Man, Billy, I have taught you so well. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. That's that's like one of the core things of usability testing. And we'll cover... We, we'll talk about that a little later. Yeah. But, I mean, we've talked about it before, but that's... Yeah, it's essentially playtesting is essentially usability testing. Absolutely, and the idea of it is is that you understand what's going on, but can they with what information you've given them? But what other HF principles can we use in board game design, though? So human factors principles that we can use in board game design, right? Mm-hmm. At least, at least for my. I was trying to be trendy with the HF. 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 Uh, Put that on a hat. What, what are we? H factors podcast on Twitter. H-factor. H. Yeah, we're the H factor, and we got to just figure out a way to. But the but there's an X in the middle of factor to make it more edgy, or three X's at the beginning followed by an underscore. This is a family show. No, no, like, <laughs> like you know X X X underscore H factors podcast underscore X X X like one of those. Gamer oh, tags like one of those whatever. gamer tags. Yeah, yeah I, I've always wanted to read those. Hey, X X X triple X. <laughs> I think they like watch too many Vin Diesel movies. <laughs> Who hasn't watched too many Vin Diesel movies? Those things are horrible, but amazing. <laughs> Stay away from the Fast and the Furious ones for exactly uh, that reason. Anyway. But they're born to ride. Uh, okay, so <laughs> first one in game. Oh, uh, can we use in board game design? Okay, right, got so it. so so from my perspective, these are these are the things that I kind of pulled out. 
Um, obviously, I think you can kind of apply the entire design process, mm -hmm. uh, like we talked about in our design episode. And if you guys are just tuning in, <laughs> if you're just tuning in, then you're listening to a podcast. Uh, <laughs> Isn't it weird when they say that? It's my old, uh, it's my radio. old radio. If uh, you're just tuning in. If you're just tuning in to this podcast, go check out... No, seriously. Uh, go check our, out our design episode. We kind of break down the process a little bit more, but... Um, I think that's where this episode idea came from. Maybe. Maybe a little bit. Mm. Um, oh, yeah. I, I don't know if that's where we generated this one. I don't know. We just... You have to listen to them all to find out. Yeah, yeah. It's listen to all of, of our episodes. Easter egg. Like Man. and subscribe. <laughs> so, uh, so from my perspective, things that we can use in board game design are like the design process, right? So... Um, obviously, you're going to sort of uh, establish what needs you have. Like, obviously, you want to make a game. Right. right. That's, that's your need. Uh, you're going to kind of, what requirements do I have? Well, what kind of game is it going to be? Is it going to be a board game? Is it going to be a card game? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be a video game? Whatever it is. In this case, it's a board game. Mm -hmm. So the first real step that I have on here is research, right? Because... Really, you'll have these ideas in your head before you approach the game. Right. Unless you're a multi-billion dollar company that is like, hey, we need another game, like, go make it. Right. They have a little bit, like, they have a whole gallery of people that that's all they do. Right. So, research, right? So, you want to take a look into what's out there already. This is what you kind of said earlier with Play Lots of Games, right? Get mm -hmm. exposed to what's out there. Uh, get a sense of what people have already sort of made. And, you know, how you can incorporate certain elements into your own game to make it your own. Like, it'll also help you figure out why certain things are the way they are. Like, one of the, re one of the things is, is uh, there's a game called House of Betrayal where you build a big stack of rooms, right? And there's first basement rooms, first floor, second floor rooms, okay? Okay. So, the idea of it is, is they, the game tells you, put it in one stack, so it's literally just like a one house set. with one room and then a house with another. Well, that's room. the thing. If you're on the second, if you're on the second floor and you need a room tile there, you have to keep pushing room tiles away until you find a second floor room. Hmm. And my buddy's always like, "Why don't you just separate the room tiles?" It was like, "You can't separate the room tiles. Why not?" And then we figured that out. If you separate the room tiles, it's really easy to stack the deck of room tiles. Like mm. if, uh, the ba basement floor doesn't have many as the second or the. Or, or the first floor. So it's easy to stack them up, meaning that you're guaranteed to get certain tiles. But right. if you're not, you're going through second and first tiles, then you have to shuffle it up again. I can go on for hours about this stuff. Right. I, I won't. But I understood that because I played the game. Over. Right, right. So, yeah. So we're talking about the research, right? Mm -hmm. Just see what's out there. Get exposed to new ideas. After that, you want to sort of imagine, like, what your game could be, mm -hmm. right? So this is this is kind of refining your overall concept of what your game is. This is where you're outlining um, your you goals. Know, yeah, your narrative. Yeah, like why? What kind of game do I want to make? Do I want to make an action game, an adventure game, a battle game, a strategy game? Yeah, that comes in here. Um, I mean that that kind of comes into it in the initial stages, but you know, definitely refining it here. Mm. You can. You, this is where you also refine your theme, like. Is it going to be a fantasy? Is mm. it going to be a war game? Is it going to be a futuristic game? Is it going to be, you know, all these different things. Mm -hmm. Like, if I have miniatures, um, you know, what what kind of miniatures will I have? Will I have ships? Will I have people? Will I have, I don't Absolutely. know, mechs? Yeah. <laughs> this mechs. kind of thing. Um, and you also want to develop a tone, right? Is mm -hmm. it... Is it going to be funny? Is it going to be scary? Is it going to be like Cards Against Humanity where it's totally <laughs> inappropriate if you play it with your parents? Absolutely. Like, Did you do that? No. Oh, my God. I can't no. imagine anyone who does. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I own a copy, but I tell my folks I don't. <laughs> you know, you, you know, yeah, sure, you betcha. I got this new uh, you game. It's called Cards Against Humanities. Do you want to play with your father and me, don't you know? You know they have like little expansion packs that are like actual... like card packs now yeah 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 those are cool oh man so so and then you're going to develop your mechanics yes right and uh you're going to get them to fix your car and, <laughs> okay bad joke no that bad was joke. a can we can I, we cut that out no Let's just no cut that we out. don't have a producer yet to do that we're doing it live doing it live all right so so this is the unique part about a board game to me mm -hmm. right because this is this is that math that we talked about yes Absolutely. Right? You have pieces that the players need to sort of uh, move across the board. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, 
and and for this you basically want to consider things like I think about almost like the ergonomics of this, right? Like, are people going to be stretching over a board to play this? You don't want a huge board, nope. or else they won't be able to reach their character that's halfway across the board. Um, but you sometimes know, you want a large board to give a sense of scope. To, yeah, for the scale. Like, look how far I've traveled in this right. board. No, yeah, I agree. I, yeah, so, I mean, it kind of depends, but it depends. Ah. <laughs> right, and, and uh, you know, it... It needs to be easy not only for them to reach their thing, but to to pick up their their pieces and move them. Yes. Right. So if you think about chess pieces, those things are pretty ergonomically sound. They have like this tall, lengthy sort of profile to them that allows you to pick them up from the top of them without like uh, you know touching the base of them and and knocking over other pieces, right? And also the larger pieces that you try have to move across the board are always taller pieces, so the fact that you can move them across yes. the board without hitting other pieces. Exactly. And and they do another thing and remind me to talk about it later. Talk about the other thing later. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Uh no, they they uh remind me when we're talking about heuristic review. Okay. Because cuz that's it it gives you a certain thing and i don't want to spoil it yet because it's it's really cool uh actually let me write that down chess all, all right, right. <laughs> so <laughs> all right so so yeah these are kind of things um you also when you're creating mechanics you also want to consider things like how people feel when they roll dice mm-hmm, mm-hmm. how do you feel when you roll dice well it depends on how the game's go what the game is but sometimes i feel really excited sometimes i want i i, I feel Excited, I feel euphoric, I feel pumped, I feel tension, sometimes I feel fear. Now, I wonder if this is conditioned from things like Yahtzee or like... No, seriously, when you're gambling, you get that same sense, right? It's like a sort of euphoria, right? Like you don't know what could happen, right? You're rolling these dice and it's... Uh, it's like tension. There's no skill. There's no skill to rolling dice. No. Nope. I mean, unless you weight them. But, but that's not even skill. That's mechanics. That's no. That's not mechanics. I mean, that's, that's not mechanics. That's, that's cheating. Not, that's cheating. But I meant like the dice is made for that reason. No. Yeah. And uh, dice provide you with this. This like like everybody has the same chance. Right. That's the likelihood. That's the probability aspect of like getting, uh, in, you know, winning or losing. Yeah. In yeah. that particular situation. So so there's that uncertainty aspect that people are like, I don't know what's going to happen, but it could be really good, it could be really bad, it could be, okay. I mean, that's one of the things about, like, very simple kids' games. Simple kids' games don't have that sense of euphoria or gamble or chance because they always want the kids to win. That's why newer games coming out nowadays give kids that sense of it, like Dixit, Apples to Apples, and things like that. They don't, they don't want to get them addicted to gambling. But they want to still give them that sense of tension. Like, pick me, choose me, will he, will it, won't he? Will they, won't they? You know, it's like a romantic comedy of emotions. Yeah, and I'm, I mean, <laughs> you said it there. Like, gamers, or games don't just have to be for children, right? Right. Like, it's, it's not just for kids anymore. No. And it never has been just for kids. Right. I mean, look at chess. Right. Five-year-olds weren't playing chess back yeah. in the day. I mean, I think that's what a lot of people associate with board games, though, is like, yeah, you know, children. Candyland. Candyland, Monopoly. You know. But I mean, like, you, uh, as a designer of a board game or a developer of a board game, you have to understand sort of, like, who your demographic is, right? Absolutely. You have to know... Who your players are, like who are you targeting? Right, exactly. I are mean, you... that age group of ten and up is the most broadest standpoint you can possibly make. It really is. Like X Wing like, Minis is not going to be like we're going after Star Trek fans. No, they're going. They after... made a Star Trek version for they, that though. Exactly, exactly. They 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 were like, I'm going after Star Wars fans, and you know they they did a lot of research on what Star Wars fans like. Oh God, that would be so metal. Star, we we I get a fleet of Star Trek. You get a fleet of Star Wars. We have a battle to see who wins. They use the same mechanics. I know. We could do it. My USS Enterprise versus your Luke Skywalker. I will blow you out of the sky, son. I'm sorry. The Falcon will wreck you. Oh ho, 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 ho. no! Because I just had my two Klingon battle cruisers come out right. of cloak. Okay, it's a nerd fight here. Nerd uh, fight. <laughs> no, but you have to. So yeah, you have to know who your players are. Absolutely. 
how much this is an important one, right? Because like, are are you designing a game that people are going to devote a whole Saturday to, or are you designing a game that people are going to want to pick up and play for twenty thirty minutes and be done? Well, actually, that's a thing that's going into game design now. People are giving rules for options. First time player, quick gameplay, and long term gameplay. Yeah, games are starting to become more module. Yeah, and that that goes back into heuristics. Dang it, man! I, I need to write that down too. Uh, Playtime. Games are becoming more modular. Like, I mean, even Clue has a modular sense, even if it's just rounds. You know, I mean, um, X Wing miniature game has a thirty minute time limit rule. Well, you can you can like X Wing for example. Mm-hmm. You can really stretch it. You can say, like, I want a 100-point battle, and that's typically about a half an hour. Yeah. I want a 500-point battle. That's That'll last you all day. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so yeah. Um, and we're seeing that in some games. Like, Warhammer sales are going down because of the fact that it takes all... Not because of the price or the time. Right. It's because it takes, like, a day to play one game. Right. You need to consider, like, are they going to, you know... Like, put this down and pick it back up later after lunch. Like, yeah. Wh- you know, how do we secure the game board? Mm-hmm. Like, are our figures secure if we're doing miniatures? Exactly. That kind of thing. And then, also, you want to consider, like, where are people going to be when they're playing this game? Are they going to be... In the backseat of a car, in an airport? Right. Or are they going to be, like, in a in a gaming... What do they call them? Like, a game shop? Game shop, yeah. Or, or, or coffee a house? Living room. Living room? Oh, yeah. CD garage? Recording all these, a podcast? All these things are, are really valuable. You have to know where they're going to play, right? <laughs> so that was that was Imagine. Wow, that was all one step. Yeah. Do all that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, so once you have your idea, right, you're going to plan. Mm-hmm. So you have all this information. Plan out how exactly your theme and your mechanics and all these things that we just talked about are going to interact. Um, and basically how you can take advantage of one or the other. And this is kind of what I was talking to you about earlier mm-hmm. when you were saying, you know, lore comes last. No, learn how to incorporate them, uh, you know, into each other. Like, how can that lore affect your mechanics, right? Like, this guy has four arms, so you roll four dice. Or, you know, uh, I want this mechanic to be um, a d20, so like a boulder damage. I don't know, something like that. I, I don't know. I don't know no, enough I about... No, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying by the idea of it, but the I, but the other thing about it is, is if you come up with... It's kind of like when you're doing math, you know? Right. Y equals X plus a number. Okay. That is the most basic way of solving for Y. Right. You know? Uh, but it gets more complicated than that. You know what I mean? Yeah, Building more complicated... Sure. But it all boils down to, you know, Y equals... Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean? And that's what it all comes down to. It all comes down to basic math, but you can make it more complicated. You should get that complication out there because then it's a lot easier to say, okay, if he has four arms, how does this affect the game? Right. Is everybody going to be a four-armed maniac? Yeah, and what kind of you know what kind of uh, negative attributes does he have for having those four arms? Like, there's there's a ton of things that you have to yeah, consider. Yeah, doesn't make it playable. Doesn't make it unplayable. Right. And, and then how so, do we balance? So once you do have that plan in motion, then you prototype. And I I really dig this. You know, as I was looking into this today, uh, you know, prototypers, or not prototypers, um, you know, the, the building a board game is a lot easier now than it has ever been. Because you can 3D print like a miniature or a game piece like there that. Is actually a, um, there is actually a website that you can go to that you give them all of the outlooks and aspects of the game a little bit of drawing from Adobe Creative Studios, and they will print you and send you your board game. Yeah, that's it's the cost is incredibly low. And yeah. so you, you build, you prototype it, and then you test it, right? Mm-hmm. And this is what we were talking about earlier with, you know, watching them play I, the game. I just want to make the point to anybody who might be listening to this for designing a board game. You can also do this with Legos and paper. Like, most of my games I've ever created were used Legos and paper. That's a great idea, too. Yeah, yeah it's I just, mean, like, low cost. You you can make it cheap, and it's great to do it then, because if you have to change something major in the prototyping stage, which you're about to talk about, you can just, you know, resend it and do it, other than buying the whole set and realizing right. these things are useless now. Right, yeah. No, that's that's great. And, and that goes with, like... Um, 
low fidelity. Like that's that's what a low fidelity prototype is. Like uh-huh. you don't don't care about the character models right now. That'll come later. That's right. the polished, uh-huh. right? That we keep referring to. So yeah, you test it, right? And and to me, the mark of a good game basically says like, at the end of it, do I want to play this again? I agree full heartedly. Right? Like, yeah. If you play a if you play a, a game that you don't want to play again, then that's you don't ever play it again. Yeah, you haven't done your job as a board game. Yeah, you know that's the idea. It's it's supposed to be fun, exciting, thrilling, easy to learn, easy to learn, things like that. Everybody should be able to pick it up, and at least even if they don't understand all the rules right away, they have a way of planning out a win. Does right. that make sense? Yeah. And and this uh, so once you've usability tested, right, you want to go back and iterate. And this is what you're talking about with the Legos, right? Mm-hmm. You don't have to send it back in to get more stuff rented out. You just they're Legos. Yeah, they're, you're Legos. You they're don't pieces to, of paper. Yeah, you don't. You you just alter the pieces of paper, and that's it. Mm-hmm, you iterate absolutely. on it. Um, now, question about, I mean, like when you're talking about these things, like from your, let's say for example, you stop making mechs for a minute there, and somebody gives you a board game to create for some reason. Right. Okay. And you're at they're at the uh, prototyping usability stage. Okay, so so they're coming to us with a product that is already kind of made and conceptualized, and they're they're uh, they're bringing me something that they have a prototype of. Right, and okay. you have to sit down. I mean, you you are doing the usability testing of it. How do you okay. do that? Well, I would sit them down in a room, like we said earlier. I'd watch what they do. I'd gather feedback on it, like. Did you think this was fun? Would you just take random people and do it? Would you take people with different backgrounds? I'd take the people in the demographic mm-hmm. uh, that they're looking for. Like, would you take people that don't play video games versus people who do play video games to test that out? I would probably grab a mix. Like, the, the healthiest thing you can do is grab a representative sample of your users. And obviously there's going to be variation within Star Wars fans, for right. example. Some are going to like Star Trek, some will not like Star Trek. Some will play video games, some won't play video games. Get get a demographic form together of things that might matter, things that might impact the way they play the game. Uh, you know, make these these sort of uh, demographic traits known. And then, and then push them out to them and ask them and... You know, get a good mix. Right. That, I think, okay, okay, okay. That's good. See, that's the idea. Like, I would think that would be also a thing to do, you know? Don't just pull from your friends who are like-minded people. Pull from people that aren't like-minded and don't even know you. Have no problem telling you your game sucks if they have to. Be brutally honest sometimes. Pay them 20 bucks. Yeah. Like, I mean, we're talking about low cost. Or a slice like, of pizza. Yeah, I mean, we're talking low cost here, but yeah, that's one thing you can do is just invite random strangers off the street. And it's, half of the, it's half of the new agey board games that I actually get, <laughs> is people just send me an email saying, hey, if you pay for shipping and handling, we'll send you this complete game. It's not complete, but it works, and I play testing and tell them what I think. So, uh, you know, more human factor, we're talking about human factors principles that we can use in board game design. Mm-hmm. We're still on this question, Billy. This is... <laughs> you. It's, this, this is, is like not, a really wide question. That, like, this is a tough one to answer, but I mean, we've handled, we, we can do it. We've handled we got, more we difficult got. things. All right. So what else I have on here is a uh, heuristic review. This right. is This is something that we do when we, you know, take a look at products or whatever. Uh, or your products if you send them in to us. Yeah, yeah. Feel free to send them in. We'll review them on the show. Uh, but these, you know, it's just simple things that you can do like, um, and this is, oh, this is what I was talking about with chess. Okay. Right? So the chess pieces... Since some are bigger and some are smaller, it really gives the user a visibility of the heuristic review is system status, but right now the overall status of the game board, right? Miniatures are great for this because you can actually see where they are on the board, spatial Mm -hmm. relations between them, Mm -hmm. how they're interacting at that moment. And you can look away from the board, you look back, you know what's going on versus a card game where like if you look away and you don't know what somebody else played... You know, like it might be, it might take you a second to realize what's going on. Or you might make a misplay because you didn't see what was going on. Exactly. exactly I agree yeah. with that. Um, let's see here. Uh, Create I also, mechanics? Yeah. So I also have, you know, consistency and standards. That's a thing. You know, just make sure you're doing what the industry is doing uh, in terms of like, you know, is, is this going to be completely foreign to somebody or is this concept relatively similar enough? 
And it's really interesting with board game design because, uh, you know, you want to make your game unique, but you also don't want it to make it super confusing. I agree. I mean, a lot of people miss the idea of the old Hero Quest game, but I've got, like, four on that shelf over there. Oh, yeah, you do. Yeah, like, I got four variations of the same <laughs> game with different types and different styles right, sitting right there. And then, uh, and then lastly, with heuristic review, uh, you know, almost all games have help and documentation. You got, like, that startup guide... This is how you play. The otherwise, rule. yeah. Otherwise, you're not going to be the able to viable play. of your game. Uh, a couple other miscellaneous notes with human factors principles mm. uh, for game design: keep it simple. Don't make the user read. Uh, don't make overly complex rules. Those just get in the way. Yeah. Um, you know, pr- provide illustrations. Oh, like definitely. That's, that's really cool. Like Lego uh, instruction manuals. Like I know that's not no, a board no. game. Yeah. But those are awesome because they just show you like this is where this piece goes. Or IKEA. I hate you, Ikea. Uh, <laughs> this is where this man is doing this praise to the sun for some reason. Man. All right. So, uh, But, I mean, you're absolutely right. The idea of it is is that when you're when your you're rule book and everything like that, you need to be able to have clear, concise conversation. This whole time we've been talking about the idea of can someone play it without my input? Right. Yeah. Can Yeah. Exactly. And that comes straight down to the rule, rule book. Exactly. If they can see it happen, they can do it themselves. Or if Wait. they make a mistake, they can actually come back to it. But yeah. All right. And then the last piece of advice I hear have here is um, allow. Uh, oh, you obviously you have mechanics, but you want to allow the player to have some freedom in how they accomplish their goals, right? And that that makes it. The strategy. That's the strategy aspect of it, Absolutely. Right? I can accomplish this goal in this many ways. And that's the idea. It creates that idea of luck and tension and narrative that you can do it. That's why people have, are really bored by games like Candyland. Because there is no different way of going about it. It it's just like, is what it is. It's one path. Exactly. Well, so, But what kind of things do you think are overlooked in designing these board games? And that's a difficult question to answer, but... I think I'm just going to go with the most important that, um, you know, obviously all this stuff that we talked about is important up till this point, but one thing is balance. Uh, I, I would say that is, in my opinion, and again, I'm not as familiar with these as you are. I, what, no, balance I, is a crucial issue in board games. Like I was saying about the idea of lore, I've played so many games where it's like, like, for example, the old West End Star Wars game, role-playing game, there was no reason not to play a Jedi. Right, it was just too powerful. It was just, there was, the guy who plays a Jedi, you can just go home. Right. You know, because after a certain Back point, up, he's just going to deflect all the bullets and get all the things and save the galaxy and you'll make a pot shot when we won't do enough. But now newer games, being a Jedi is still really cool, but the balance is there because you need the smugglers and the troopers and the soldiers and things right. like that. Yeah, so you want to you want to basically make a game that a lot of people can have fun with and, mm-hmm. and play their own way, right? That goes back to the options thing, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I have here that you know, at least in my notes, I I put that balance is kind of hard to come by mm. um, because you know unless it's a free for all where everyone's just kind of. Uh, you know, going at it, it, someone, whoever this is, will always go first. Someone will always go second. There, there's like most, almost all the time. There's turn based, and and this, for better or for worse, provides an unfair advantage to somebody somewhere because the people who go first, you know, have the advantage of going first. And then the people who are going second have the advantage of seeing what the first person did. Absolutely. And again, it depends. It depends. It depends on the game. So, you know, a balance is really hard to achieve. Not to mention the fact that sooner or later, people are going to think up of ways to break your game that you haven't. Right, exactly. You know, and you got to keep that in mind and you got to just kind of roll with that. Right. Uh, let's see here. So I have also that with balance... Um, you know, there's, it's got to be balanced, but there, there's still that element of chance and luck. Mm-hmm. That kind of plays into it. And then you want to make them feel like they have this opportunity to win, even if they're playing maybe a disadvantaged role or a uh, character or whatever it is in your mm-hmm. game. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, you also want to take into consideration a certain element. You want to take in that chance, the idea of chance and luck. And, I see, 
these why this is why people use dice in games. The random chance is equal across all people, meaning the balance is there. Right. There's an equal chance that everyone will or will not do or do not. There is no try. Right. They'll do well or they won't do well or exactly. You know, it's, it's all right there. And that's the thing. You also got to look at like we said before the relationship with the players in the game. You can make it com- com- competitive, and you can make it more balanced. You know. But right. how can board game design help other forms of design, you know, applicable to the real world? Right. So like, we this, talked about the idea of video game design, but what about other stuff? Yeah, so this is something that I was thinking about as we were, you know, uh, preparing for the show. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think, you know, there's a lot to be learned from board game design uh, in that, you know, just like we talked about the design process again, that... That is pretty ubiquitous across all... Good word usage. Thank you. <laughs> That's pretty ubiquitous across all uh, all platforms, right? You always want to do that design process to make your product as best as it can be. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and specifically, though, these, these principles that we've talked about in board game design can be used in other games, right? There's a lot of transfer over, right? Yeah. Whether that be sports. Uh, you can design a new sports game that... Um, incorporates math that would be cool golf and rugby came from somewhere that's true that's true yeah i mean like golf takes into account like how many swings you took to yeah never once did the clouds part and the gods came down and said i bring the football everyone came up with these ideas yeah so new sports new sports uh i have video games card games Mm -hmm. basically any game that you think of you can just just what I'm what I'm saying here is that you there's all these intricacies and and properties that will be unique to each one of these and so to think about those as you're going through this and basically how can you utilize those um, you know yeah to, I mean and and oftentimes companies will make virtual counterparts of the same game right so like you see like Scrabble will, yeah you'll get like words with friends and and you know. Like, look at your phone right now. Chances are you have a couple of games on your phone, even if it's just Tetris and Snake. Right. Uh, but, like, yeah, with, like, these board game analogs, right, you have you have to think about how you have to accomplish the same mechanics that you accomplish in, on a board. In a video game. In a video game. So you have to show a digital representation of the board. How does that happen? Um, like... A lot of the great, we talked about it before, a lot of great designers come up with that idea. You know, they come up with the saying, do board games to make video games. Some of the greatest board game designers of our time moved on to video games. Why? Because they had a bet and made success. Um, One prime example is Brian Tinsdale. Brian Tinsdale made seven launches for Magic the Gathering sets. He made seven different Magic the Gathering sets. He was the lead director of design for Wizards of the Coast for about 12 years. Now he makes a lot of money making video games. Now, mind you, it's for Zanga. No, I'll say what you will if they work. You know, they, they work. They, millions of followers yeah. and people play. Like I said, don't discount any game. And yeah. now he designed some of the most, the greatest and most played Zanga video games. Man, and you know, yeah, these successful adaptations of these these board games, they're they're crazy to me. And and you have to think about like how web design and app design come into play. Mm. Oh, I see what you're doing there. Yeah. I think web design or app design. I think uh, mobile I think so too. Mobile yes. app design should be next week's episode. I agree. I agree because the idea of it is is that you're trying to get a clear concise idea in a small almost condensed format it seems like. Yeah. Let's talk about this next week. I do agree. I agree. I agree. Okay, so what's so, next? So this is the part of the show where we hear from you guys, our listeners. Billy, who do we have today? Today we have an email from Ellen Alkapi. Hey guys, I, you've mentioned mental models on the show before and it got me thinking about how there are some things that I can't even begin to understand how they work. Like, how all my devices in my home are connected. Can you... You... How do you... Can you... How do you know, design the absence of a mental model? I think what they're asking here is, can you, and if so, how, how do you do design? You design? Yeah. Oh, oh okay. I'm sorry. A mental model. That's okay. Uh, so thanks for the question, Ellen. Um, so I think 
you know, at the at the basic level, everybody kind of has a mental model of something, right? Mm-hmm. Like, even if she has no idea how the devices in her home are connected, she has, you know, she at least knows that they're connected. She probably, I have no idea how Wi-Fi works. I just think it's like giving off radiation that goes out to the world. That's your mental model. Of yeah, it. that that is it. Yeah, and so when you when you design around that, like for me at least, when I when I think of my devices in my home, I think of them all as you know, kind of like like Wi-Fi is almost like the wire between them, whether mm-hmm. or not. And I'm really into the Internet of Things, so I have advanced diagrams of how each one talks to each other and which protocols and. Which language is? I still and, believe the internet's all in one giant server room in Miami. It could be with Al Gore sitting in a rocking chair, thinking of mint julep, <laughs> saying, "One day I'm going to turn this whole thing off." Man, yeah. So, so, but yeah. To answer your question, Ellen, I think I think you you would still probably have a mental model, even if you don't know how it works. You know, you you have some sort of idea or representation about how it works mm-hmm. uh do you remember what show we we mentioned this in mental models was that mental it? models was in our was that, i think it was also our design show was it design or displays oh that's a tough one yeah i'm not sure i think we actually talked about it in design okay because we were talking about how we design something so many tie backs to design yeah right download design listen to it tune in for that one but All yeah, right. so 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 yeah. Um, in terms of absence of a middle mo- mental model, I don't think. I don't know. I, I think that you know, even at the very basic of senses, you have some idea of how it works. Like the other question about it is: is what's holding you back from that mental model? Not being wrong. Yeah, I guess that's a good question. But I mean, that's the thing, uh, Ellen. This this is don't don't. It doesn't matter if you think it's cherubs that come down and. Prick out the information if that's how you if see that's it. if that's how you think it works if that's how you visualize it the only idea is is it goes from one place to another the how well, well yeah it depends and, and and here's the thing that's that's what us human factors folk come in and do we look at how you guys sort of look at the the situation and then we design around how you how you view it right mm-hmm. like for me if they're just talking to each other over the air. That's how I would design my interface. I'd say this one needs to talk to that. Mm, I, I agree, I agree, I agree. All right. So anyway, I think that's going to be it for the for today. If you guys want to be featured on our show, we're all over social media. Go ahead and comment on our SoundCloud, Facebook, or Twitter. Send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com with all your questions. You can also get to the front of the line, at front of the question line, by supporting us on our Patreon site at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. <laughs> yeah. Be sure to like, subscribe, and review us on iTunes, the Google Play Store, SoundCloud, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. We're always trying to keep in touch with interesting topics that you guys, our listeners, want to hear about on the show. So feel free to suggest a way. As always, I want to say thank you to my co-host, Billy Hall, for the suggestion. Hey! Billy, where can they find you? They can find me on Twitter and streaming on YouTube at Comstar Cleric. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends! depends.